Dr. Balan Jalal here. So in this video, I'll be talking to you about sleep paralysis and answering some of the most common questions that I get about sleep paralysis. So the most common question that I get is, why does sleep paralysis occur? Like, why does it happen? Um, and the answer for that is, uh, for the most part, pretty simple. So the basic neuroscience of sleep paralysis, like having this experience of being paralyzed upon awakening from sleep or upon falling asleep um, and sort of being aware of your surroundings but totally paralyzed from head to toe, this phenomenon occurs because of a simple brain mechanism. So in the lower part of the brain, in the brain stem, we have certain neurochemicals that is responsible for paralysis of the entire body. And so when we are dreaming, you know, in REM sleep, uh, during rapid eye movement sleep, uh, the brain is clever. It says, look, it's not a very good idea for me to act out my dreams and hurt myself. Like, imagine, you know, sort of wrestling with an alligator or sort of, uh, you know, whatever you're do doing in your dream that is quite intense. You don't want to act that out and potentially hurt yourself with a person sleeping next to you. So your brain paralyzes you during REM sleep, right? So you have that. Um, and at the same time, uh, during sleep paralysis, and this is where the sort of magic happens, your perceptual centers of your brain become uh, prematurely activated, even though you're paralyzed in REM sleep. And this is sort of this synchrony to the architecture of REM sleep, being perceptually awake on the one hand and physiologically paralyzed in REM sleep. Well, that dual state is what sleep paralysis is, being perceptually awake but being physiologically paralyzed during REM, having that REM paralysis. So this is why sleep paralysis occurs. And, and you know, sleep paralysis occurs in animals, in cats and things like that. So it's not a unique, it's not unique to humans uh, per se. Um, so this is why it happens. Now, another question that I just typically often get is, does sleep paralysis happen more commonly to certain people or during certain situations? Um, and the answer to that is yes. So when you're traveling, for example, you tend to have sleep paralysis more. And so why would that occur? Well, it seems like sleep paralysis um, occurs or is sort of uh, partially related uh, essentially to genes that regulate our sleep-wake cycle. Now, um, so you can imagine when you're, when you're traveling and your sleep-wake cycle is sort of a bit wacky because of you know, traveling, you know, shifting time zones, you're more likely to have sleep paralysis. And of course, when you are traveling, you, you might have, you know, be more anxious, be more stressed out. And anxiety and stress also is more likely to sort of lead you to have sleep paralysis. And uh, the reason for this is that um, it's more likely when you are anxious, right, that the perceptual part of the brain would become activated during REM and sort of push you into becoming perceptually aware and, and, and awake even though you are in REM. So for some reason that is still unclear scientifically, stress and anxiety can lead you to have more sleep paralysis. Now that partially answers the question of, of whether certain people are more likely to have sleep paralysis and it turns out yes if you have anxiety say, say clinical anxiety you're more, more likely to have sleep paralysis you have more you know a frequent sleep paralysis uh, as well um, and uh, trauma patients people with uh, PTSD people that have fragmented sleep you know people with you know disturbed sleep are more likely to wake up during REM perceptually and have this uh, sleep sort of have sleep paralysis occur to them um, what else? Well, um, people, actually high school students or college students tend to have very high rates of sleep paralysis. So it turns out if you are uh, a college student, a college, a college student, you're more likely to have sleep paralysis. And the answer to that, again, if we sort of think about it, when you are in college, you have exams, you have stress, you have anxiety. And so it, it makes sense that you'll be more likely to sort of... Uh, you know, have sleep paralysis occur to you. So if you are a college student, you are a college student, you are more likely to have sleep paralysis. Um, and it runs in families. So there's a, there seems to be a genetic component to sleep paralysis where sort of it, it runs in families. And, and if, so if you have a family member who has sleep paralysis, you are also more likely to have sleep paralysis. Um, now, another common question that I get, and this is sort of, closely tied to my research, uh, which is, can culture affect sleep paralysis? Can culture impact 
the hallucinations during sleep paralysis. Um, so let me unpack this a bit. There is sleep paralysis, this state of being paralyzed, unable to move or speak, as we, as we mentioned, but that's sort of not the same as having hallucinations and seeing shadows and seeing ghosts during sleep paralysis, which is, um, you know, it's, it's a different thing, meaning that you can have sleep paralysis, just wake up and sort of realize you are unable to move or speak, and, and that's it, and you're a bit fearful, and, and that's it pretty much. You can have that experience. So, but it's only around like 40% or so, uh, our research suggests that uh, of people who have sleep paralysis that then go on to see like ghosts and shadows and uh, faceless creatures and things like that. Um, so these hallucinations don't always come with the experience. But now can culture affect, the sleep, paral affect sleep paralysis? And the answer to that is, is yes, in fact. Um, and I spoke about this in length in another video, so check that out. But uh, and done, we've done a lot of research on this uh, for uh, around a decade now. Um, so check that out. Yes, culture can affect it. In fact, my own sleep paralysis are sometimes sort of affected by my cultural context. Um, I remember I did some interesting studies in Egypt uh, and, and you, know, you know, I saw a lot of TV and, 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 you know, a lot of, I was following the news on the internet and it's apparently for some reason I was having a sleep paralysis episode and I was hallucinating this Gaddafi-like creature uh, hovering over my, my body. So that was quite a striking and unique experience, but it speaks to the fact that yes, Culture can certainly influence uh, sleep paralysis, how frequent it becomes, and, and even um, our research you know, seems to suggest that, you know, color the content of the hallucinations as well. Meaning that, yes, during sleep paralysis, you tend to have, or all over the world, people see sort of some, some of the similar things of like shadow-like beings, they might hear footsteps, they might have a, ch a chest pressure, uh, tingling sensations and stuff like that. So there is certainly that robust phenomenology uh, to the experience. But at the same time, culture seems to provide an extra layer of complexity where, you know, whereby it colors the hallucinations and, and provides a unique sort of uh, experience in that way. Another question, is sleep paralysis always horrifying? Is it always terrifying? Do you have to see ghosts, right? Do you, or, or can you perhaps occasionally sort of have a visitation of a angelic-like figure? And so the, the answer to that is yes. I mean, our research does, we have cases where people talk about like angelic figures, you know, you know maybe on a white horse sort of uh, appearing in front of them or other sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, experiences like that where it's, where it's quite striking and, and, and positive in that way and, and something that, um, you know, you would say is, is a very positive and, and good experience. So for sure, you can, you can have that. Um, what other questions do I usually get about sleep paralysis? Well, um, what is the worst sleep paralysis case that I've seen in my research over the past decade? Like, which, which sleep paralysis episode is the worst? Um, I'd say, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of them. Um, there, I remember a, uh, one case of a person that, uh, you know, they were sleeping in a certain way and somehow uh, they had visual access to a mirror, meaning, so they were sleeping, lying in their beds, bed there, but for somehow the, the mirror was angled such that when the person was looking up, they could see themselves. Now, uh, see themselves. Now, the person, this is a lady, somehow she was when she saw herself in the mirror during sleep paralysis, right? So she's lying there, par paralyzed, unable to move, uh, move and speak. And then she sees herself self in the mirror. And lo and behold, like what she saw was very you know, nasty. I mean, it was something where her limbs were all sort of uh, twisted and stuff like that. Very, very uh, vivid and terrifying episode of sleep paralysis, a case of sleep paralysis that I remember um, I had to sort of, uh, I, I was looking at. So that was quite something. But I'd say more than the cases that I've sort of looked at, you know, all, all around the world, I think my own sleep paralysis episodes are the more terrifying ones. The reason just, just being that it's, you know, it's a personal thing and it's the subjective experience, right? Of you being there paralyzed and, and just being faced with this overwhelming fear and you know seeing a ghost in front of you or you know having a sense presence a hallucination so you sense uh that there, you know ghosts of presence 
with you and stuff. It's terrifying. And so I'd say that is more terrifying uh, by far than, than, you know, you know, hearing about the most, most, uh, you know, a petrifying episode from somebody else. You know, it's just that personal thing that is, uh, I think, unique. Um, I saw, so I'd say that. Um, what else? So can you treat sleep paralysis is a common question that I get. Um, and the answer to that is yes. In fact, um, I've developed a four-step psychological treatment for sleep paralysis. It's called meditation relaxation therapy. And this therapy was really designed based on my um, sort of work with patients and people with sleep paralysis, you know, for, for many years. And, and then just listening to them and hearing about what seemed to help and what did not help and stuff like that. And, you know, based on all that feedback, I was devised, so I devised this, this treatment. So it's four steps that you implement during sleep paralysis. Um, the first step is when the sleep paralysis strikes, when the episode strikes, the first thing you do is that um, you try to keep your eyes closed. Uh, so that's the first thing, and, and I, that makes sense in a way, right? So you want to avoid, you know, having visual distractions and seeing things like the mirror I mentioned uh, that can sort of influence your, your brain and make you more likely to hallucinate. Um, so close your eyes and then you focus, and then actually then you reappraise the meaning of the attack, meaning you sort of reinterpret what's happening to you. So instead of going, oh my God, I'm paralyzed, I'm, you know, about to die, there's a ghost here. You sort of tell yourself, well, look, this is sleep paralysis. It's common all around the world, right? And so there's no reason for me to be afraid, right? So basically you re reinterpret the whole situation. It's sort of what we call cognitive reappraisal in fancy uh, clinical terms. Now, after you've reappraised the uh, situation and you've sort of taken out that panic, um, what you do is you psychologically and emotional, emotionally distance yourself from sleep paralysis. You go... Since, you know, it's just sleep paralysis and it's a common benign experience for the most part, well, there's no reason for me to actually, you know, uh, be terrified. So, you know, let me just have this thing pass by me and, you know, and, and occur to me and then that's fine, right? So, you know, basically what you do is you psychologically and emotionally distance yourself from the event. And, and this kind of social, uh, psychological and emotional distancing is a common tool that we use in, 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 in ther you know, that's used in therapy all the time. And, and we've certainly used that in our, in our clinical uh, manuals and treatments and stuff like that. So it's a very well-known to tool that you use in therapy, but now I'm just applying that to sleep paralysis. I'd say that the, the, the unique thing now is that at this point, right, so you're lying there, you've you reinterpreted the experience, you have sort of um, distance yourself from it, then you focus all your attention on something positive. And the reason for this is that, uh, look, you have limited attentional abilities and, 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 and you're, you can only focus on so many things at any given moment. So the idea is that, you know, you sort of recruit all your attention and put it on something extremely positive and sort of prevent your mind from going to all kind of, you know, uh, ominous places and 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 sort of engage in all kinds of negative you know thoughts that can lead to hallucinations and fear so you focus on something extremely positive which is a form of emotion centeredness you center your emotions and this can vary from person to person and, and from culture to culture for sure so some people it can be a prayer for some people it's focusing on something uh you know their mother's face or whatever that makes them really sort of brings comfort to them but the idea is that you want to have your attention focused all on 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 uh, at once at something extremely positive finally the fourth step is you avoid moving you know during the experience so this is just uh, the idea that, you know, and this is actually very deep. Now, I will try to answer this in a different video, but the idea is that um, when you are in uh, sleep paralysis and sleep paralysis is occurring to you, uh, usually the, the common uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of reaction to sleep paralysis is trying to move, right? So you're trying to escape the attack, so you'll try to move. Now that kind of movement, um, you sending commands, your neurons saying, move, Beland, move, move. Uh, but lacking proprioceptive feedback from your body, meaning your body normally tells your brain how to build your sense of self, right? And during sleep paralysis, it can't. 
it cannot send commands back to the brain telling it how to build your sense of self, the sense of Balan being anchored in this physical body, right? So I close my eyes, I have a vivid sense of a body image. That feeling cannot be created properly because you don't have feedback from your limbs that are paralyzed. So by you sending commands, move, 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 and no commands coming back from your body, that can lead to disturbances in, your, in the way your sense of self is created and can explain some of the weird hallucinations of seeing your arms and legs flying in the air and things like that. I've certainly had some of those uh, hallucinations during my sleep paralysis episodes and I hear them all the time of you know, people telling, uh, telling me and, and doing research and stuff. So that's a common thing. The, sh you know, the, the crux of the matter here is that uh, avoid moving, uh, just relax, uh, you know, don't try to control your breath. By controlling your breath, which is automatic due to the REM physiology, it could more likely lead to pr uh, chest pressure. And by trying to move all the time, it can feel more like sort of spas a spasm, uh, you know, uh, give, um, lead to a spasm-like sensation, uh, sensation in your limb, like something is holding you down and stuff. So avoid moving. In short, four steps. Reinterpreting sleep paralysis, this is distancing yourself from sleep paralysis, focusing your attention on something extremely positive, and then fourth, um, you would, uh, as I said, avoid moving and just sort of accept the physical sensations, which you know are strange and and can be annoying and uh, stuff like that. So those are the four steps. And we actually did a study, um, I think last year, published last year, in patients with narcolepsy. This was a pilot study. Um, intriguingly, we did find that by using this, uh, you know, MR therapy, meditation relaxation therapy for eight weeks, we saw about 50% plus reduction in sleep paralysis episodes in patients with narcolepsy who would experience frequent sleep paralysis. Now, of course, this was a very, very small, small pilot uh, study, and we have to replicate this in large studies, but it's nonetheless... I believe the first ever study on on any treatment for sleep paralysis so it's a step in the right direction and we just have to do more uh, rigorous work of course um, so those were um, some other thoughts that I had now I also often get the question what was the worst kind of hallucination that I have had during my sleep paralysis episodes um, and it's it's hard to really say which one was the worst uh, for me, I guess the first one that I had where I sort of felt that a ghost was present in my bedroom and was pulling my legs up and down and, and was trying to strangle me and really sort of kill me. And it was very funny. I could sort of read its, you know, its intentions and I knew it was an evil, vicious creature and stuff. Um, so that episode I had initially that really intrigued me and, and made me you know, do research on sleep paralysis was probably the worst episode that I've ever had. But I've had many, you know, I've had many. I've had episodes where I saw myself sort of floating in the air or a copy of myself and, you know, having conversation with, with that copy. Or um, I've had episodes where I just had a really, really strong sense presence of something evil. Actually, I had an episode of a friend. I had a deceased friend, a friend who passed away, and I saw them during sleep paralysis. Um... So yeah, I've had a few interesting ones. Um, I'll tell you, during one of my sleep paralysis episodes, I actually, um, this was a, during the time where I was sort of designing my, my therapy for sleep paralysis. And I, and I thought to myself, well, is it possible for me to actually sort of create my own sleep paralysis monster? Like, what if I, you know, try to you know, during sleep paralysis, I'm paralyzed and unable to move or speak. But what if I try to move you know, then intentionally try to create some disturbances to my body image. And then, you know, instead of, instead of focusing on something positive, what if I focused on a ghost and try to imagine how that ghost might look like? And in, fa in effect, possibly, you know, activating a REM mentation or REM dream imagery and, you know, possibly, you know, uh, help uh, really uh, trigger a hallucination of, of a certain type. Um, so this was my thought, I wanted to do this, but when I was actually in this situation during sleep paralysis, I, I couldn't complete this experiment, so to speak. I was just too terrified. It was just, uh, I was just lying there and I just, I thought, no, there's no way I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm already, I feel like there's something evil here already. I'm not going to go down that path. So I never got to complete that, um, that little, you know, uh, you know, uh, experiment there. And um, I'd say that during another episodes of sleep paralysis that was really interesting again i thought let me play around and see if i can uh 
have some fun here. And I was actually, um, this was in California. I was sleeping and I realized, my God, I can actually, I'm awake during sleep paralysis, right? So it's sleep paralysis, I'm paralyzed, but I'm awake, but I can actually leave my physical body. So, and this is where sometimes sleep paralysis can turn into a lucid-like event. You become lucid and have a lucid experience. And so I kind of left my physical body and became a ghost, so to speak. I became a, uh, a ghostly figure and, and like, a, you know, a, uh, uh, this, this person, like this ghost-like figure, I was walking around in my apartment uh, and I, th I thought to myself, what do I do now? Like, I'm a ghost. You know, I'm a ghostly figure here. My physical self is lying on the bed sleeping. I got to do some kind of, you know, experiment right now. And so on the piece of paper, I saw, you know, scrap paper, a little piece of paper, and I put it in my pajamas. And I thought, I'm going to go back to my physical body. And if, you know, this piece of paper is in my pocket when I wake up in the morning, then uh, I would potentially have, you know, showed something uh, of importance. Of course, I was, I'm just being playful. But anyway, I, I walked back as this ghostly body having this lucid experience. I jumped back to my physical body and, uh, and the next day I woke up. And uh, the question is uh, whether that piece of paper was in my pocket when I woke up. Now, I won't actually answer this uh, question this video i'll keep it to the next video where i will talk more about like why we actually see ghosts during sleep paralysis meaning our theories and our hypotheses so it's not totally known why we actually do see ghosts during sleep paralysis it's still something that we are uh you know working on as scientists but we have some ideas so, so i'll talk about that next time and also some ideas and some hypotheses some scientific papers on why we you know we have out-of-body experiences and things like that um so I, I hope you enjoy that. Um, I think that was all I had. Any other questions? No, I think that is, that's it. And, and yeah, I do want to add like one final point. So sleep paralysis is sometimes understood as just one thing. So sleep paralysis, you know, people say, well, you wake up, you're paralyzed, you can't move and you can't speak, and then you see a ghost and that's sleep paralysis. But as I, as I touched upon earlier, sleep paralysis can be a lot of things in a way. So you can have that paralysis and feeling you know feeling awake and stuff but occasionally you might see a ghost you might have a sense of presence sometimes you just you know feel like you're you're sinking into your bed as if drowning in, in quicksand or like you are you know you know you're flying in the air like a tornado you're just you know uh, going around or you might feel like you have an out-of-body experience or you, it might feel like a dream all of it so it feels very dreamy and it feels very sort of more like a dream than actually wakefulness so that's and that's where the limit between being perceptually aware and being in, in dreamland, like being in the world of dream is, it, there's a fine line. I mean, occasionally you can sort of feel, if you feel like you're more sort of awake, but occasionally it feels more like a dream. So you can have that. And, and so there's a lots of types of sleep paralysis. And, and so potentially at some point we might go into that. Um, so yeah, that's what I had to, uh, for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll put some... Uh, uh, do some more videos in the future. Have a great day.